Well, thank you, everybody. Welcome to Week to Week, the political roundtable from the Commonwealth Club of California from Monday, April 4th, 2016. Um, this, of course, most recently was, was the weekend when uh, just days after she warned that immigrants were being lured to this country by free soccer balls and teddy bears, Sarah Palin, who else, tweeted a photo of herself over a freshly killed brown bear in an, uh, an appeal to Wisconsin voters to support Donald Trump. <laughs> this is true. Uh, so Sarah Palin's back in the news. Don't worry, we're here to help you get through it. <laughs> Thanks for joining us here in San Francisco. I'm John Zipper, your host for Week to Week and the Commonwealth Club's Vice President of Media and Editorial. On today's program, obviously we're going to be talking about a lot of the presidential news, uh, the race that's uh, winding its way along the presidential trail coming to California. So this is, we're, we're in an exciting period here. But we'll also talk about some state and local stuff, elections, uh, as well as the new minimum wage that was just passed. You saw the governor signed it today. Um, and other political news. As always, I note that uh, the Commonwealth Club has people of a wide variety of views. We welcome that, we love it, uh, but any views that are expressed up here are those only of the speakers and not of the Commonwealth Club. And by the way, this is true, today is National Hug a News Person Day. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it right here. <laughs> <laughs> We'll try to stay within the bounds of propriety, but uh, we'll just welcome them to our stage. So let's meet our panelists today. I'm going to start on the far end. You've already heard from Melissa Kane. She's a political analysis, excuse me, a political analyst with CBS San Francisco. She's also the host of The Cheat Sheet, and she's an attorney. She's on Twitter at Melissa Kane one Next to her is Carson Bruno, a research fellow at the Hoover Institution, where he specializes in California politics and policy. He's on Twitter at Carson J.F. Bruno. And next to me is Joe Garofoli, senior political writer for the San Francisco Chronicle. And guess what? He's on Twitter at wow, Joe thank Garofoli. You, thank you for that smattering. <laughs> <laughs> It's always good when you bring your family. Yeah, no. <laughs> they would have booed. <laughs> Listen, there are question cards spread throughout the room. I think uh, most of you know how we do it. Write down your question, and we'll have the, the cards picked up, and I will try to ask as many as I can during this program. So on to our round table. Let's start in my home state, Wisconsin. The Wisconsin <coughs> primary election takes place tomorrow. In fact, hello to my mother, who will be listening to this on podcast. She is going to be spending all day tomorrow, starting at like six in the morning, uh, running a voting precinct at the St. Paul Methodist Church in Green Bay. So good for her. Yes, that I consider by indirectly, I'm helping the electoral effort here. Anyway, <laughs> in Wisconsin, um, something strange was happening. We were chatting about this before the program. Some of you may have heard conservative talk radio, which had so long been a very powerful movement in the country, has been hurting of late. They've been losing listeners, they've been losing advertisers. Um, in Wisconsin, there are some conservative talk radio hosts who A, are quite popular there, and B, have been having quite an impact, it looks like, on the primary race there on the GOP side. So I'm gonna start with you, Joe, because you used to work there, live there and work Absolutely. there in the Cheesehead State. <clears throat> What do you make of the Charlie Sykes interview with Donald Trump? Did any of you, do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Again, his family, thank you for coming. Yes, yes. Um, well, first of all, Wisconsin's a place that usually goes with the front runners. And this time they're kind of veering away from that and their uh, cruise is out in front on the Republican side. And, and Bernie Sanders has a slight lead on the, on the uh, Democratic side, sort of too close to call though. Um, and, but talk radio is very powerful there, it was particularly in southeastern Wisconsin where Milwaukee is, Racine and Kenosha and all those places. And um, so usually talk radio folks, they don't, you know, they want to make their marks and, 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 and differentiate themselves. But there, they're agreeing on one thing. We all hate Trump. Uh, so, um, and, and Sykes, it was probably about a 17, 18 minute interview. And it was one of the more pointed ones that he that that Trump has uh, endured, um, and that he didn't he gave him no quarter. He pushed back on a lot of stuff. He called him a fraud. Uh, he called him a uh, he see, he called him out on his decorum. He said Wisconsin, we don't do that kind of stuff. And 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 Charlie Sykes, uh, you know, it, it, he's been around there since since we lived there, yeah. you know, 25, 30 years ago. Um, and he so he's an institution. Mark Belling is also a, another talk show host there, and he's more of the um, uh, um, a Michael Savage approach, if you will. He's, he, he called 
uh, Trump, uh, I don't think he got an interview, but he called him like a big wuss. And so that's the, that's the type of level we're dealing with with him. But he is like, but he's more of like a rabble rouser, that type of thing. Anyways, all these folks have come together and they're, and they're largely, maybe not largely responsible, but they have a, a decent hand in, in pushing folks towards Cruz. Not that these guys all like Cruz, but he's the leading alternative to Trump. Carson, what do you make of what's going on there? Because Trump seems not to be connecting in Wisconsin, even though he has connected in a number of different types of states. I've seen a few different kind of hypotheses out there. Uh, one being that actually, if you look at the polling in West, or, uh, sorry, Wisconsin, um, you <clears throat> find that Republican voters in particular, but voters on a whole, mm -hmm. are much more kind of happy with how things are going. They're not as pessimic, pessimistic about the direction of the country, of their state. Um, they seem to think that their finances are doing okay or doing better than average. Um, so that kind of goes against the grain of what Trump is saying, where everything's terrible, America's losing, and we need to make it a great again. Um, so in, I feel like in that Wisconsin, isn't helping. If the Packers have a good season, basically things are right. okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you think I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> That's not far from the truth. Yeah. So I, I think that has a big portion yeah. going on in the state. And then plus, I think the never, the never Trump movement is starting to actually work in that sense that it's starting to convince a lot of people that anything is better than Trump. Start to look at the other two candidates, in this case, Cruz and Kasich, and figure out which one you like and vote for that person. I think it helps now that Rubio is out of the game mm -hmm. that you have two very different kind of approaches to the Republican Party in Kasich and Trump, or sorry, uh, Cruz. Yeah. And that allows kind of the two wings of the party to really start to coalesce around the two candidates that they may like the best, which really will hurt Trump when it comes down to the numbers. Melissa, uh, Wisconsin, is that going to be a, a pivotal state then for the, the GOP race? Uh, I saw someone on, tw on Twitter call it the Cheddar Wall. <laughs> <laughs> we can always bring it around to cheese when it comes to Wisconsin. <laughs> we really can. Uh, you know, will it be pivotal? Not necessarily. I mean, remember the next election is New York. And Trump is polling like 30 points ahead <clears throat> in New York. Clinton is polling like 12 points ahead in New York. And don't get me wrong, uh, the, the New York primary is April 17th. So that's like an eternity between the two. So anything could happen. But uh, it's likely that once you get back to the East Coast, back to New York, and then after that, it's Pennsylvania and Maryland, um, back to sort of the, the, the backyards where the front runners, I think, are a little more comfortable. Uh, I don't know that Wisconsin is going to necessarily knock everybody off. Although for Trump, it really does matter. I mean, he really needs those Wisconsin delegates. Clinton, she can kind of, if it's a close race, remember, it's for Democrats, it's proportional. Eh, you know, he gets 50, I get 40, fine. Um, it's fine for her, but Trump really needs those. I think that could really make the math a little harder. And of course, at the end of the day, um, whenever he loses, oh, it's terrible. As a Californian, I get excited because it means we're more important, right? He needs us more, <laughs> the less he gets elsewhere. So, um, it's always exciting for us. If he doesn't do as well, he actually you know, has to focus more on California, which hey, I'm down with. Uh, the other thing I do want to point out, I don't know if you guys heard of this Charlie Sykes interview, like my favorite thing about this interview is that, so Trump had had, had a list of about a dozen judges that he was mm. thinking of making Supreme Court justices or proposing to be Supreme Court justices. And one of them was Sykes' ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> And Trump had no idea. He had no idea that he was doing this interview with the ex-husband of like one of his justices. It, it, and Sykes just went to town on him. It was like, <laughs> somebody gave you a piece of paper. Like you have no idea what's even on that list. Like it was bananas. So it was just like a really big gap. It's for me, it's like the thing I remember most about, about the interview was just like. <laughs> it brings to mind uh, David Brooks, the conservative New York Times columnist line about uh, Trump that he's running for you know, Abraham Lincoln's office with all of the preparation that most of us put toward buying a sofa. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not taking it seriously, and this is a very important thing. I, um, sticking with Trump for just a little bit more, uh, he <laughs> got into, uh, I was gonna say got into a controversy. He's always in a controversy. He got into <laughs> yet another controversy um, when he made a comment uh, in response to, was it a Chris Matthews interview about, yes. and he was asked about abortion. Mm -hmm. and, and should women, if, if abortion is illegal, should the woman be punished? And he responded that basically, yes, somehow they should be punished. Um, he got criticized, obviously, I mean, really across the board from, from pro-life groups, from obviously from the left. Uh, 
it seemed to have, and, and again, maybe it's just in light, I mean, it happened around the same time he's been beaten up by uh, Charlie Sykes in Wisconsin, right. but uh, it, it seemed to stick to him a bit, whereas in the past, if he says something that a lot of people disagree with, that kind of helped him. You know? Yeah, I think that the, the difference was here is that one, you had the, the thing that he said that was offensive to women, but then it also, <clears throat> since abortion is such a core issue for Republicans, um, to not have your answer down on that one is like you know, kind of Republican 101. Right. And so it goes to, uh, it kind of went to his preparedness on this, you know, the, to the sofa buying uh, uh, formula. And he is not prepared. He's not, he's not done, there's been no evidence that he's spent a lot of time, you know, crafting policy papers and, and thinking about what he thinks about. Um, so that's, that's, and so it was kind of an illustration of that and it was in, in combination with something that's offensive to, you know, many women yeah. and men. I, th I mean, I think it's, it goes to show, I mean, if you think about that interview, I, f I forget who he did it with a while back, but he basically called himself very pro-choice. These might not be his exact words, but basically yeah, it was yeah. the gist of it all. And then he kind of shifts all the way to v very extreme, you know, position on yeah. abortion. And it kind of, I think it reinforced that, again, he has no ideological yeah. rudder. He's just kind of saying whatever he's saying at the time, and then he deals with it later. And I, I agree, on an issue like abortion, conservatives, Republicans, want you to be with them, and this kind of shows that he's not really there, or he's trying to be something he's not. I mean, he had like four different answers. Yeah, he had like, and on uh, that issue, they, will, they w will figure out if you are trying to BS them or not. And it's not just a matter of there are a lot of anti-abortion uh, Republicans, it's that they are the ground troops of the party. Yes. They, you know, they, they've, they've built the, you know, the Iowa party from ground up mm -hmm. in, in recent decades. So it's like, it's not just, oh, well, we've lost some suburban Republicans, but we'll gain them in, in the South. They've lost the folks who are gonna ensure that, you know, the elderly folks get to the, to the voting poll and, and will do the phone banks and all that especially, stuff. Especially in these Midwestern states, yeah. where, yes, there's a lot of the blue collar kind of people who have maybe voted for Democrats, but they're still socially uh, conservative. Um, they care about these issues, even if you might not, they might not be voting for you for president in, in that primary, they still care about these issues. Well, and remember, he's been trying to go around and say, interestingly, that he would unite the party yeah. and unite America and turn some states Republican that might not be, you know, historically. And so it really bit into that narrative when you start alienating like what was like 74 percent of women. I mean, even forget like who's going to be voting in the primary. But if you, you know, if you look down the road to the general election, it just that plus the Heidi Cruz thing where he was mm -hmm. tweeting, you know, uh, you know, pictures of, of Ted Cruz's wife, just alienating large swaths like that. I, I, Peggy Noonan called it like um, and I'm paraphrasing here, um, like an accumulated ball of grossness. Uh, <laughs> Of his, of his behaviors toward women that were just like, and so you turned off not only parts of the Republican Party, but once you see, you know, he can't, it's harder for him to make the argument that down the road, he is a viable candidate in a general election. It's harder and harder for him to make that argument when poll after poll is showing mm -hmm. he has alienated not just Republican <clears throat> women, but, you know, other women who would be voting in the general election as well. And so that's, um, you know, that's, I mean, he part has, of the problem of that is it, it really is part of a, a number of other things that he's done. He is, I mean, north of 60% unfavorable rating. I mean, it, in yeah. some polls, it's, it's you know, nearing 75%. I mean, that, that's, it's impossible to etch a sketch to put that you know, in Mitt Romney's uh, advisor's terminology. <laughs> um, <laughs> that away, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. you are, you're in such deep red territory, and red being a deficit, not, yeah, not, Republican, not in a good way, <laughs> um, that it, it's impossible to claw your way out of that anymore. So I, only he, and I do believe he thinks he can do it still, because he's completely delusional, uh, but only he and his, and his hardcore supporters really think that he can actually expand the map and win the majority of, of voters <laughs> in, in November. <laughs> well, so uh, thank you, Melissa, for your presentation to, to begin with, because that gets into a lot of, okay, what do the Republicans do? What does Trump do uh, by the Republicans? What, are the, what does the establishment do? What, are, what do the anti-Trump Republicans do? And then, of course, what, how does Trump respond? Um, and how do other folks who maybe are watching this, who kind of, they're all doing that, that uh, uh, calculus of if this happens, that opens up this a possibility. Um, and you mentioned, you know, it goes to the House, 
Paul Ryan's there. My favorite headline of today is from USA Today. It's, quote, Paul Ryan running out of ways to say he's not a presidential candidate, <laughs> <laughs> um, Is he a potential white knight, regardless of what he says? And if not him, is there someone else, or do they make their peace with Cruz or, or Trump? I mean, what, what, if, if you're... There are a lot of folks here who are not Republicans, but if you're a Republican, you want the party to continue and, <laughs> and uh, not uh, explode. What do you do? Well, to be clear, the, the Speaker of the House is usually the chairman of the convention, right? So when we talk about, as, I, I know for those of you who are my previous presentation, we talked about how at the beginning of the convention you have to adopt a new set of rules, and there's all this parliamentary procedure and all this wrangling that's potentially going to be happening at the convention this year. And the Speaker is usually the chairman of the convention. He's up there with the gavel and sort of dealing with all of these votes. If there's any inkling that he has any desire or interest in being the candidate, that would be a problem, right? So um, he's got every incentive to at least say, no, 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 I'm not interested because he needs to be able to perform his duties as the chairman of the convention. So um, I'm not saying he's lying. I'm just saying Maybe. Uh, I'm just saying um, he, he's really benefit. He really has a lot of uh, incentive right now to just to, to try and pull himself out of it and pretend to be neutral, at least um, at least initially, um, so that he can try to sort of preside <clears throat> over the convention itself. Yeah. Politically, there's no answer. You can't say, yes, I'm interested. He's going to he has to say I'm not interested. And plus, as the rules are written now, not they they can and will be changed a couple of weeks before the convention. But he's not a he's not eligible because you have to win eight states, the majority of the majority. delegates in eight states. I mean, as the rules stand, no Kasich's not eligible. Uh, they're going to change those. Yeah, they'll still yeah. change yeah. it. But, um, but so I, I don't know. I think that it would already, if Trump is very close <clears throat> and he doesn't come out with the nomination, you're going to have a major disenfranchisement issue there and people are going to be ticked off. If Everybody, all the three major candidates are shut out. I think there's going to be a real problem. And, and you know, White Knight or not, I mean, that, that just thinks, I, I just, it looks like an episode of House of Cards and not what, you know, what's, <laughs> what's actually going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I'm, call me, uh, I'm, and of course, I'm dead wrong in public nine times out of ten. So, uh, <laughs> but I think it's going to be one of the three. And, and like Priba said, who's well, there? Well, I, I, I agree, yeah. Really? I, I think it is going to be one of the three. And I think... Right now, the RNC has kind of no good options going on for them. I mean, Trump would be a disaster. Cruz wouldn't be much better, to be honest. No. Um, he, he runs into many of the same walls that a Trump candidacy would. would. Um, but he's more lovable, isn't he? Uh, <laughs> Maybe, maybe relative to Trump. <laughs> on that scale, but, yes. <laughs> yeah. but if, I mean, if his unfavorables are only at 71%, that kind he of... He's actually at 53%. He's, okay. he's the next worst. Clinton is slightly behind him. Uh, but uh, there's just no good options uh, so you know, available to you. everyone in this country in November is going to be hate voting. Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yes, definitely. Okay. Well, I was listening carefully to Melissa, so I just have to ask... Um, when is it too late for John Zipperer to put his name in? <laughs> and, uh, April 24th. Okay. Just so you know. Here's the thing, though, with Clearly Paul Ryan also, schedule. though. Why would he want to run this yeah. year? Why? Yeah. You know, he... he Unless he thought hard, it was a He did not want to be speaker. He did, uh, yes, he uh, eventually accepted it. But why would you want to be speaker during this whole ordeal? He's doing <laughs> the best he possibly can out of it, but why would you want to run for president in this environment with all just the divisiveness that's going on right now, especially within your own party. Why not just wait, you know, do well for a few years in the speaker, maybe go home, run for governor, um, and then run, and he's young. I mean, he's, what, 40-something, 42? Yeah, early 40s, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he has time. He does not need to be president, the presidential nominee this year. Okay. Before we move on to the, some Democratic uh, candidates, uh, someone in the audience asked, uh, does anyone know how Wisconsin awards its Republican delegates? Is that winner-take-all? Kind of. Uh, so they have 42 Picture. delegates. 
Um, 18 of them go to the winner, right? Go to the sort of overall person who gets the most votes, right? So that's the 18 are sort of the winner take all. Then they also have eight congressional districts and each of those districts has three delegates. So the overall winner in each district gets those three delegates. So just like California, exactly just yes. like California. So, so Trump for good example, could, could lose a bunch of, you know, could lose statewide or lose in seven of the districts and still get three delegates. So, um, it's not, it's not the case that one person is necessarily going to get this whole bucket of delegates. It could be, it could go different ways depending on what happens in each of those eight congressional districts. Okay. So that's the chess game going on in the Demo in the Republican party on the democratic side. It's getting tighter between uh, Sp uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton and uh, Senator Bernie Sanders. Um, what do you make, uh, I believe it was Rachel Maddow had an interview with uh, Bernie Sanders this week and asked him about something that sounds so arcane that most people couldn't care about it, but I think it's key. And that was, she was he was asked, uh, would you consider, because he's been, you know, spectacularly successful raising money from millions of folks in small amounts, really great grassroots connections, out raising Hillary Clinton by more than $10 million, I believe, in the last month alone. Um, and she asked him, would you consider help using your fundraising machine to help some of the down ticket Democrats, the senators, the congressmen, the governors, and such like that? And his response was, Meh. Meh. I'll look into it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, and, and the reason I say this it is It was like if it had never occurred to him. Right. Yeah. It was like, oh, well, that's an idea. I'll yeah. talk to yeah. my people. So in all this talk <laughs> about superdelegates, um, those superdelegates, a lot of them are down-ticket Democrats. <laughs> so, um, I mean, did he just kind of basically say, I, don't, I wasn't really planning on getting this far? <clears throat> and I it's mean, not surprising. The guy is not, I mean, he hasn't been, uh, you know, he caucuses with the Democrats, but he's not been a, you know, full-fledged member of the party. So that's he, thinking in party terms where you raise money for other people, so they come around and raise money for you. That's what he's railing against, mm -hmm. the whole system. So it's like you're asking him to buy into the system that he's trying to lead a revolution against. So it doesn't make sense that he, you know, or it makes perfect sense that he'd be like, well, like, think about it. But the problem is, um, one of the major reasons he's losing is because he's losing all these super delegates who were, as you say, members of the party. So, um, yeah, he's, <laughs> it was kind of a very telling moment, but uh, not a surprising one, but it was, it was very telling. And it's not going to get a lot more super delegates with an answer like that. Yeah, no. <laughs> I think what, I think what you just said, he's running, he's running a revolution yeah. and he talks about that a lot. You know, this is a revolution. You, you can't run a revolution from the top down though. I mean, it, it, those tip, tip, those revolutions t don't end up well usually in our, in our history. Um, you need the grassroots and he does have an enormous amount of grassroots support. I mean, yep. that, that his fundraising ability really showcases that. Uh, but you have to then kind of translate that into the next step. And the next step is the, are those down ballot races. I mean, it, it, Democrats really kind of rail on Republicans and their success at the state level, but what they tend to forget is Republicans spent years, years, election cycle after election cycle of building benches at the local level to then make them, get them to run for state legislature and then for statewide office and then for Senate, Congress, whatever. Um, that takes a long time, and the Democrats really haven't replicated that quite yet. They're, they're making advances. Uh, but that's something where a, a Sanders campaign could actually move the needle on many of the key things that he, he holds so dear to his heart, policy-wise. So that's why I'm, I was surprised by that. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. well, that's obviously how you're going to actually keep the fire to Hillary Clinton's yeah, that's how you you know, build a revolution. feeds well, whenever and, she's and, in the White House. And, and to be fair, Hillary Clinton is ahead even without the superdelegate. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. Um, so I have to ask our lawyer on the, on the stage, Melissa, I saw a story uh, online today, so you know, who knows if it's true or not, but it said that the GOP, excuse me, the GOP delegates could be bought legally. Can you tell us there actually what's is stopping Donald Trump from just saying, vote for me, here's a big check for each and every one of you? Yeah, there's really nothing, actually. Uh, I, I plan to be in Cleveland at the convention, and I, I would not be surprised at all to see a parking lot full of shiny brand new Teslas or whatever, uh, <laughs> or Ferraris or Humvees or whatever the hell. Um, no, they're really, you know, when you dig down and you start to say, okay, let's assume we have an open convention, and let's assume everyone's just trying to sort of figure out who the loyalties are and, and you know, get them to vote for their candidate. Um, 
there's really no legal issue uh, or there's no law that prohibits a candidate from trying to purchase, even outright, even like with a briefcase full of cash, um, a vote from a delegate to be uh, to mm. vote for them. And so um, this could be a very, very interesting <laughs> scenario where you literally could have bidding, right? And you've got donors, even like like the Koch brothers or like Sheldon Adelson, who really haven't weighed in. They've kind of kept their powder dry, who may, you know, you, the, the possibilities are endless in terms of how uh, this could look and how disgusting this could be <laughs> uh, at the convention. And again, if it's open, people are already going to be freaking out uh, and feeling disenfranchised. And then if there is... Uh, you know, again, there's legally it would be fine, but the optics of a, a actual purchasing of delegate votes would be, you know, 1968, Chicago. Yeah. You know, it would be it would yeah. be very bad, but but legal. I think, but I think this actually goes into something nicely about how Cruz is actually starting to work behind the scenes, mm -hmm. especially in a lot of these states that are winner take all states. So you have Arizona and South Carolina and Florida, the the kind of the, the big ones that are winner take all by state. And so uh, Trump won all of them. Technically, those delegates um, are bound to him for the first ballot. After that, they're anyone's game. Right. But they don't select their delegates until well after, um, after the primary. So what Cruz's campaign has been going into these states and actually getting people who either a, a, you know, very explicitly pledged to him, or he knows like through the inner workings of state politics that these people are his sort of Republicans. And so, you know, if he can get to the convention with no majority for Trump, and they does get kicked to the second ballot, I wouldn't be surprised if you saw Cruz win on the second ballot or at least the third ballot. And he's in California, he's way ahead of the game. Yes. They've been working on this yes. for several months. And they have a very good operation to do this. Trump's uh, no. state Trump's operation. Is, no, yeah. yeah, the Cruz's operation here is amazing. I mean, yeah. Ron Neering, who's the former state chair of the party, former chair of the San Diego party, is his national co-chair. He has been working this state up and down like no one else, um, building up his delegate ranks. My prediction is that this GOP national convention will break all viewership. Uh, <laughs> it, I mean, we're all going to watch it. I mean, popcorn and beer or whatever. I mean, it's it's going to be fascinating yeah. and fun and a little scary. Educational and, too. I mean, it, yeah. I mean, no one. It'll knows be the first time that we've really any of us have ever seen a truly open convention. Yeah, potentially. True. I mean, it's looking that way. I mean, we're yeah. still have some time ahead of us. But. Well, um, any thoughts on uh, after Wisconsin? We go to New York. Anything to look for there? Anything significant? It sounds like you were saying earlier. Trump's way ahead on the Republican side. Trump's there. way ahead, and and Clinton's uh, ahead too. I think Melissa said that. And and, uh, but I mean, it's like how much. I, I'm looking forward to the stories of you know people. There'll be a greater focus on stories about people who have uh, had direct interaction with both Clinton and Trump, and as a business person and as a senator. Uh, so we'll, I think we'll they'll flesh that out a little bit more, and I think we'll hear stuff that we haven't heard so far. Do you agree, Carson, Melissa? N numbers wise, 50% uh, is the key in New York for Republicans. If uh, Trump is getting above 50% at the state level, he gets all of the delegates. Um, at the congressional level, the same thing. It, it's a uh, winner take all trigger at 50%. Otherwise, it's proportional. Um, so, I mean, that's the number to be looking for. Mm -hmm. Can Cruz and Kasich keep him below 50%? I don't think there's any chance of either of them actually really competing for him for the wins, um, but can they keep him below that, that, you know, that threshold so they can net some delegates out of it, again, keeping him below that uh, 1237 number? Um, the, the Democrats, it could end up being an interesting race. I mean, the polling has been on a clear trajectory for Sanders in the New York polling. Granted, there's not much out there. Um, but he's on, he's on an upward swing, and Clinton's kind of, kind of flat. Um, so. If I were Clinton, I'd be worried about New York because if it comes, I think if even it comes close there, that kind of could create some image problems for her. Um, and if she loses, dear God, I mean, that's a, that's a oh, terrible, that's terrible thing for her. <laughs> um, but we, again, we're, we have quite a few weeks ahead of before that mm -hmm. comes around. So if she pulls off a, a surprise win in Wisconsin, I think she's fine in New York. Do you agree? Melissa? Yeah, but if she doesn't, I mean, remember, so that would be four in a row that Sanders would have won, yeah. right? Three of them dramatically, and then Wisconsin will probably be close. And then he goes into New York, and if he makes it close or wins, like, that kind of momentum is going to be, you uh -huh. know, it's going to have an effect. 
and, and the super delegates are the ones paying attention to that. You know, they're not gonna they're not gonna bail ship on the on the Clinton, you know, H H M S H S Clinton, you know, <laughs> whatever you know, want to call it, um, unless they are very clear she is kind of losing steam. Something's happening. This is not gonna go well. Um, like we saw in 2008. I mean, they st stuck with her until they kind of realized, oh, Obama's got this in the bag. There's no way that she's going to turn this around. Um, and then they start bailing in droves. We don't, we're not at that point, nor do I think we're near that point yet. But losing New York, yeah. I think there are going to be a lot of reassessments at that point. Okay, good reasons to stay connect, stay tuned throughout the month. Um, let's move to some state and local elections. This is not the, the presidents are not, the presidential race, excuse me, is not the only thing that will be on our ballots this June here in California. Um, let's talk a bit about the U.S. Senate primary race. There are 31 candidates? 33. 33? 33. See how easy it is to get on the ballot. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of folks. Um, uh, Dr. Larry Gerstin, a uh, frequent week-to-week -week panelist uh, and also a, a, an NBC Bay Area uh, political analyst. Um, he noted, so Kamala, Kamala Harris has, nine, has raised $9 million as of January. Uh, Loretta Sanchez, $2.7 million. On the GOP side, Duff Sundheim has 300000 raised. Tom Delbacaro, am I pronouncing that correctly? Yeah. 188000 um, Are those the four candidates that we're likely to be talking about uh, with any shot? Yeah, well, Ron Unz is also on the ballot. Ron okay. Unz, uh, uh, but I think he is doing it more of a... Uh, to raise uh, awareness about another issue in, in, the, in the fall ballot, so and he and he's said that. Okay. So um, that's that's a major reason is the, is the fundraising. Um, <clears throat> I, I talked to Duff a couple of weeks ago. He goes, well, I, you know the the, the now that the, you know California is going to matter and we're going to have all this attention here because of the sort of the Trump bump. Because you know uh, I'm I'm able to hire a, a fundraiser now. It's like. Dude, it's March. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, so um, I'm thinking of opening campaign offices. Somewhere. Yeah, yeah, and, and and those guys are. I mean, and they're, and they're uh, Duff's a, a, a very earnest guy, and, and you know, but he, you know, those guys are driving themselves around. It's not a major operation, and that that's hard. And it's and the Republicans in California, um, and the unusual thing that may happen is that that this there could be you know since the top two finishers, uh, the top the, the people with the two uh, most votes move on to the general election, it could be two Democrats. The Republicans have a math problem in June. Yeah. They do. I mean, that it, when you're talking about 33 candidates, there are 11 Republicans, there are seven Democrats, uh, two Libertarians, one Green, one Peace and Freedom, and 11 uh, nonpartisan uh, no MPPs. Um, <laughs> You know, even at a very favorable kind of 40% Republican turnout, yeah, in the 2012, 2014, the kind of the non-major Republicans, they still win votes. They still get percentages. Ron Unce is going to get a good number of votes. Greg Conlin, who ran, has run for Senate before in 2012, he ran for uh, Treasurer in 2014, he's going to get a good number of votes. Phil Wyman, a former state senator, he's going to get a good number of votes. Um, you're starting to look at, you know, Duff and uh, Tom Del Beccaro are going to be splitting, you know, roughly 20 to 25 percent of the vote. Um, even if Sanchez just gets one third of Democrats, she's at 16 percent right there. Um, so Republicans are in a math problem. They, they have to figure out a way to cons one of them has to figure out a way to consolidate uh, in, in order to kind of get most of the, that 20, 22 percent in order for them to kind of make it into November. Um, and it becomes harder and harder when you have semi-serious kind of non-major candidates also on the ballot. So uh, we're probably going to have pretty strong Republican turnout this yeah. primary, right? Because 15, 15 to 30 percent bump because of the excitement. Does that potentially make it more likely that one of the Republicans can get into those final two where they might not in, a, in another year? What Del, uh, Del Beccaro and, uh, told me, and this is very telling, he said, I don't know if there's a direct line from like the Trump voter to our campaign. So they, they <laughs> kind of, <laughs> uh, so kind of want to, they're, they're excited about obviously having more Republicans voting, uh, but they're not quite sure of where those guys are. Are those guys going to come in and, and vote for just the presidential race? And then, you know, it's like, you know, I'm going to go to lunch. Uh, or, 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 do they, or do they stick around and vote through everything on the ballot? It's, you know, like many things in this election, 
election. They don't know, and even the campaigns don't know. Right. And so, are they? And are they actually Republicans? And are they Republicans? Well, you have to be a Republican to vote in the presidential. But are they the primary? But recent if, Republicans, exactly. <laughs> because you know, if you are a you know, switched your party to vote against Trump, or you are newly into involved, are you going to act again? Are you actually going to vote for everything below mm -hmm. that that uh, that ballot line? And it's a big big question mark. Yeah. I think as long as they're spread out between and among so many of them, that right. even 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 the increased turnout is not going to result. Yeah. You, to your point, you got to consolidate, or else you're not going to. They're not going to be able to compete, even with Loretta Sanchez. Yeah, I, I mean, and 33 candidates. That's a that's a lot of people to kind of sieve through to figure out who um, who am I going to vote for here. <laughs> I mean, that's a big ballot. It is a big ballot. We're used to them around here, though. Yeah, that's true. Um, but it's well, be speaking even of other in November. speaking of other things that are going to be on that giant ballot. Um, there are some measures, not a ton of them, but there are some. One uh, is kind of interesting, Measure AA, I believe it's called Clean and Healthy Bay Ballot Measure, is that it? Yeah. Carson, can you tell us what that is and, and what its chances are? So in uh, June, um, in the nine Bay Area counties, so San Francisco, Santa Clara, San Mateo, Alameda, Contra Costa, uh, Solano, Sonoma, and Napa, Marin. Wow. Um, we have, <laughs> I was practicing that on the car ride up. You know, could I get them all? Um, we will have a, um, a, a proposition on the ballot in each of those counties that will um, increase taxes to pay for Bay Area, or sorry, the, the San Francisco Bay restoration and flood protection and some other issues re related to the Bay. Um, it is interesting because it's one of those rare uh, ballot measures that while it's on the ballot in each county independently, it's actually a multi-county kind of coalition um, effort to, uh, to actually make it pass. So what I mean by that is if San Francisco votes for it, but everyone else votes against it, um, there's a very big chance that it won't happen at all, not even in San Francisco. Um, so all nine counties need to vote on it, and all nine counties... Um, of the total vote, two thirds need to vote in favor of it. Um, so again, that throws another wrinkle into it. So even if, say, you know, you have Napa and Sonoma, which are only kind of tangentially attached to the the actual bay uh, itself, if they say no, this is terrible, we don't want this, you know, this tax increase on us. That you know, really only San Francisco and a few other places are going to benefit from. Um, if the margins are large enough in you know, San Francisco or San Mateo and Santa Clara and Alameda and Contra Costa, then you have a chance where it could actually pass. So it's again, it's the aggregate of all of the total votes, two thirds of that needs to, uh, needs to move forward, not two thirds of each, each county itself. And by, um, by new taxes, we're talking $12 annually per yes, parcel. Yes. And is yeah, that commercial yes, and yeah, private? It's a, pro yeah, a property tax measure. Okay. So they're estimating it'll raise about 500 million over uh, 20 years. So a, a substantial amount um, that both business interests and environmental groups have actually kind of backed up behind this bill. You have you know, the major players like the Sierra Club, um, and as, as well as the uh, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, a major kind of uh, chamber of commerce type uh, organization in the South Bay. So it, it'll be interesting. It's the one of the, the first times you know, recently that this kind of multi-county effort has really moved forward. And if it is successful, it could really be a, a kind of a blueprint to, ha to tackle some of these other more regional um, issues, housing being one, mm -hmm. transportation being a very big one, especially in this area, and uh, uh, something that you know, other kind of regional counties could try to experiment with in Southern California or the Central Valley. Uh, there are some other things on the ballot locally, uh, Measure C in San Francisco on affordable housing. San Jose has a Measure C, but it's on medical marijuana, so you don't want to get those two mixed up. <laughs> um, but uh, probably AA is probably the big one. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the other thing, there's a statewide ballot measure, oh. too, uh, which is going to pass with flying colors, um, that allows for members of the legislature to be suspended without pay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and this goes back to, of course, the Leland Yee <laughs> issue where he was allowed to, where there, where there was no, they found that there was no legal mechanism. You could either remove someone from office after they were convicted, or they just got to sit there and keep collecting their paycheck. And so Leland Yee, for example, one of many legislators who was able to continue <laughs> receiving his pay while he was sort of on trial and before he was actually adjudicated guilty. So, um, so this measure, again, 
super popular, uh, it would allow, would, would sort of create this sort of suspended without pay designation so that, so that uh, the legislature could do that to, uh, to the crooks. Uh, I mean, whoever. The accused. colleagues. <laughs> alleged, alleged uh, <laughs> um, in Sacramento. So that's the other thing on the ballot as well that, uh, yeah, we're okay. fairly confident in. Well, let's uh, talk about our next topic, which is something that uh, was signed into law this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, Governor Jerry Brown signed a bill to raise <clears throat> the state's minimum wage to $15 an hour in stages over the next six years, I believe it is. Um, at the same time, New York Governor and Andrew Cuomo signed a similar bill uh, <clears throat> in that state. Perhaps of a humorous note is that Governor Brown actually physically signed this bill at the Ronald Reagan State Building in Los Angeles, so I'm <laughs> sure he did that with a bit of relish. Um, Joe, what, uh, what are the politics on this? Is this is, I, well, they, I'm and, assuming that, again, he signed it where he signed it. I'm sure he's thinking right. this is a bit of a signature bill. Yes. And, uh, he, they, and he admitted there they, uh, that he felt the pressure. There were a couple of ballot measures that were going to raise the minimum wage. He's like, well, let's get out in front of this. And, and there was an example where uh, citizen pressure actually did force the uh, legislators to, to move very quickly on this. I mean, it was very quick. Um, and there's an, one interesting twist to this thing that, I've, uh, that, that, you know, that the governor definitely wanted in it, even though he's, he'll be out of office. Um, is that if there is a recession or there's some sort of economic downturn, doesn't be officially a recession, the governor can call a timeout for oh, one really? year and say, well, we're not going to raise the minimum wage this year. Uh, so, but it's a one year timeout, then they reevaluate it. And, uh, and the New York wage is always, you know, New York and California competition. Um, but that's only for New York City, and I think they're going to phase it in around the state. Whereas in, San, in uh, California, it's all over the state all the time. Well, that's a good question. I'm going to ask Carson that. A minimum wage increase in San Francisco up to $15 an hour, I think people are, are pretty clear. Yeah, wow, of yeah. course. You know, it's, it's a horrendously expensive city. In a small town somewhere else, it more positive impact, more negative impact? I mean, it's going to be a different impact is what I'm I, getting at. I think I'm probably the only one in this room that actually is kind of against this, this bill. <laughs> um, but, um, and here's why. The, 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 the issue kind of driving minimum wage increases particularly is to combat poverty. And we do have enormously high poverty in this state, uh, particularly in this region, uh, especially. Um, but the minimum wage has economic impacts. It does change the, the nature of how you do business in this state. And in regions such as you know, the Inland Empire, Central Valley, where wages aren't high to begin with, you're at $15 an hour, you're pushing your wage your minimum wage up to close to you know, 50 to 60% of what the median wage in those regions already is. Um, and that is going to have clear negative impacts on employment in those regions, areas which are already very highly, um, have very already high uh, unemployment levels. Um, so it, it's, in a way, it, by making it a statewide kind of blanket sort of approach, you are actually making it much harder for many of the people who really need help in the state to actually find a, a job to be able to help pull themselves out of poverty. Um, there are much better tools out there like the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit, uh, which actually are very, very efficiently target poverty. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how this plays into effect. Now the problem with minimum wage increases, studying them, uh, that is, is that they are phased in over such a long period of time. This one takes five years for businesses that have greater than 25 employees. For anyone that has an uh, employee level of 25 or fewer, they get an extra year to comply to each of the increases. Um, five to six years, that's a very long time in terms of the economy. Think about over the past five to six years, what has happened in our economy. I mean, Nationally, we've seen you know, oil shocks. We've seen the European sovereign debt crisis. We've seen um, you know, the implementation of the ACA, you know, a lot of things. So how do you isolate the minimum wage increase from all this other noise going on, which makes it almost impossible for a study to really kind of pull out the effects of that minimum wage increase. So um, t take, take minimum wage studies with a, with a big grain of salt uh, when you see them. Berkeley likes to put a lot of them out. Um, and you know, the, the methodology may be absolutely correct, but the problem is how do you isolate this one, t actually relatively tiny piece, but has a big impact on a lot of these employers. 
Melissa, your thoughts? Uh, could it backfire on uh, Brown and his allies? Well, here's the thing. He's worked in this sort of this sort of stopgap, like that that there's this this uh, and this this was his big thing that he was able to negotiate into the proposal was this idea that if we get into a recession, you could do a one year halt. Um, that's never going to happen. Like, think about the politics of that. Think about what the the, the unions who 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 are who are responsible <clears> for <throat> this bill would do if a future governor, I don't care who you are said, no, we're going to pull, you know, we're going to pull the little break on the minimum wage increase this year. They go ballistic. So this, I, it's, I find that this whole thing is like totally illusory and, you know, you could love it or hate it, but this idea that he sort of negotiated in this very responsible recession thing is just like, all right, sure. But no I, one is going. I think a Republican governor would, 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 would think, who doesn't have to rely on the union support would be would and be, that would be... Yeah, well, you never know. You never know. <laughs> Seven years is a long time. Has he been born Seven yet? Seven years is a long time. I'm not sure. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. Uh, that's it, not... You, in, in the Between now and, and, you know, 2022, when this thing is fully <laughs> implemented, like, I don't see there yeah. being any chance of a Republican or even moderate governor who is going to actually use that break. Now, if they do, that's fine. But the whole idea, uh, you know, that, that politically it would be feasible uh, is, uh, I don't know, I thought it just seemed to me like a kind of a, a, a thing to, to make people feel better, but it's not an actual uh, break okay. in, the, in the system. But there is one good thing about this Person? bill from a political sense, um, from a policy sense, no, but from a political sense, <laughs> yes, um, is it, it, it attaches, it basically indexes minimum wage increases after 2022 to the CPI, to inf inflation. Um, what that does is essentially removes this from a political debate ever again. Yeah. There is no need for the state legislature to go in and increase the minimum wage. So I'm sure they won't. The, which they might, <laughs> but they, they, they lose a lot of ammunition. <laughs> um, and they lose a lot of the argument that uh, the, the big thing is, you know, it, it takes the state legislature to increase minimum wage. So before 2013, it hadn't been done for, you know, five, six, seven years. Um, a lot of, you know, happens in that time period. Now there's an automatic increase based off of inflation. Um, it kind of removes it from a political sure. kind of perspective, which now allows us to actually start talking about policies that actually will affect and help uh, and alleviate poverty. Okay. Well, before we get to the news quiz, let's do a bit of a lightning round to get some of these uh, questions in. Someone asks, do you think Donald Trump started this uh, race as a lark, but when he saw he early success, decided he really had a chance? <laughs> Qu quickly, yes, no. I, I think, think he yes, a true yes and no. I mean, he, yes there, there's, no. he's been talking about it for years, and he's tried it a couple of times. But I, I, I do, you do get that impression, like just, just everything about it, from the from the rolling down the the escalator to that first thing. It just said, it just says so. <laughs> Seems so pulled together at the last minute. Yeah. Like, let's put on a show, you know, type of thing that went awry. I don't know. He does seem as surprised as anyone at yeah. his at his success. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not saying he's not enjoying it or he's not oh, taking he's it totally seriously. But it, he yeah. seems to he. I, I don't know. I get that sense from him too. That like he, you know, why don't you have an, a, an answer for abortion? I don't know. Yeah. I don't think I get this. From him. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, you know okay. be playing golf. <laughs> okay. Next question. What chance is there that the Democrats can take back the Senate in November? High if it's Trump at the top of the ticket. I mean, it, and if it's Cruz? If it's Cruz, a um, little bit more difficult, <clears> but you know, it's probably a 50-50 chance at that point. If it's Kasich? Kasich, no, there's no, there's no chance. If that it's John would. Zipper? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Don't wait for the, the polling on the head. Head. I don't see the polling what, on what, that. Side okay. or, what, what, what ticket are you going to be on, John? <laughs> Uh, rumor has it that some Republicans are working on supporting Bernie Sanders because they have all the dirt on him and can crush him. Care to comment? I'd like to see those rumors. What's your, show me some links on that. <laughs> okay. I'd like to see some Bernie Sanders dirt. Yeah. <laughs> Bernie Sanders owns stock. I mean, polling wise. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. Very good. <laughs> This, uh, this tugs at my heartstrings. Any chance that someday candidates will not focus on minor issues, but big issues for the United States, like infrastructure, education, and global warming? Uh, um, after this election, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no? no? Sorry. Okay, um, well, let's do our news quiz. 
Uh, for those of you who have never been here before, which might be two or three of you, because I see a lot of uh, familiar faces, I'm going to read a news quiz question. If you think you know the answer, raise your hand. Don't just shout it out. And I'll point to you, then you can shout it out. If you're correct, Fran will deliver a little bag of chocolate. Some. Sorry? Ghirardelli's? Um, I would, but there are probably legal issues of if I hit someone in the head. <laughs> I don't want to see the, you know, the tweets and the Facebook memes of people blinded by uh, Ghirardelli chocolate bags at the Commonwealth Club. So, first question. According to uh, New York Magazine, did a big article on this, Donald Trump has been left, quote, sweaty and spent, unquote, after campaign events because he's wearing what? Way in the back, I saw your hand first. A bulletproof vest, that is correct. I was gonna say Spanx. Um, <laughs> did you say what? Spanx. Sorry? Oh. Spanx. Okay. Uh, here's one, we'll see it's how- It's a bad uh, image, by the way. Yes. <laughs> astronomers. Astronomers say they have a plan to shoot giant lasers at far away planets. Um, why would we do that? Uh, sir? They want to hide us from aliens. That's right, that, 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 could, that could make us invisible to aliens, hostile aliens, obviously friendly aliens we'd welcome. Wow. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, a massive leak of data has revealed claims that uh, political and business elites around the world have hidden billions of dollars. What is this leak called? Oh, right there in the middle. Panama Papers. The Panama Papers, that is correct. Um, the oil kingdom of Saudi Arabia is reportedly building up a two trillion, that's with a T, T as in trillion in fact, a two trillion dollar fund to prepare for what? Actually, uh, yes, I'm gonna give it to you. It, it's, they're actually preparing for the post-oil era. So right here in the front row. Um, Alaska Air is paying $2.6 billion to purchase what other airline? <laughs> <laughs> I did see your hand first right in the second row, but there were a, uh, sorry? Virgin America. Virgin America, that's correct. Okay, on Friday, uh, let's skip that one. <laughs> It's good to be king. Uh, <laughs> here's a story, let's see if you saw. GOP frontrunner Donald Trump, say it with me, reportedly has bombshell insider dirt on whom, ma'am? Fox News. Fox News. Ooh, everyone goes, ooh. You guys hear about that? <laughs> the entire news? <laughs> It was apparently, so was it New York Magazine that wrote, that, that broke Obviously, it? I was at the New York was, website today. It was like yes. the New York Observer. There's a New York-based magazine that, that broke basically this issue that there was, there was a communications director for Roger Ailes who was leaving his employee, and he did not, he basically hired this really fancy lawyer, and I forget the lawyer's name, but uh, to sort of negotiate his exit package because the, they got the communications director who's leaving is like, I know all the dirt on you. So... Uh, Donald Trump happens to know the fancy lawyer. And so they bring him, this is according to the article, they bring in Donald Trump to sort of negotiate between Ailes and the fancy lawyer on behalf of the communications guy. So in the course of mediating this, Trump learns all the bombs that the outgoing communications director, who by the way ended up with $3 million, so he knows something. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so he ends up with, so he mediates this sort of employment dispute and in the course of it, at least according to the article, he learned all of this really cool dirt uh, on Roger Ailes. And so then the idea is that maybe he's using that or sitting on that somehow. You think? Uh, anyway, that's He the wouldn't one. do that. No. <laughs> okay, next question. Uh, despite an attempt to remove it, Princeton University has said it will not remove whose name from uh, campus building. Sir, I saw your name first. You're in first. Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, that is correct. Um, Police in Hanover, Germany, have asked residents to stay away from windows and not to wave when what happens later this month? They're not supposed to be near their windows or wave. Uh, they're supposed to stay away from uh, the center of the city. Anyone want to guess? Can a police car drive by? No, but it does involve someone going by. Someone raise your hand and guess. Ma'am. Nope. 
Sir? Obama. That's right. President Obama is going to be visiting uh, some big industrial trade fair. And you can't wave the, at The good folks of <laughs> Hanover have been told to basically wow. make themselves scarce. Be cool. Yes. <laughs> um, let's see, just a couple more. The White House has said that in the summer of 2030, there could be 30,000 people killed by what? Do you see the story? They're holding a summit on this, roughly. Sir? Climate change? Uh, I'll give you a climate change. Uh, they're talking about a summer heat wave that uh, could kill 30,000 people. OK, our last wow. one. What, what Who spent Sunday volunteering at an Oakland, California school? These are two non-Californias. Someone raise your hand. Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton and? Bill and Chelsea Clinton, that is correct. Listen, we'll be back with more news quiz questions and of course, a lot more to discuss uh, on Monday, April 21st, right here in San Francisco. And you can find our week to week news quiz every Friday on Huffington Post. Thank you to our panel, Melissa Kane, Carson Bruno and Joe Garofoli. Thanks to all of you here today, listening online, watching on TV. Have a great week. <laughs>